Welcome to St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Brenham, Texas. My name is Stephen Whaley, I'm the rector, and we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. A couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, we're uh, worshiping from our chapel, uh, right adjacent to the nave. This is the chapel of Our Lady and All Souls. And we have been recently gifted uh, another icon from um, one of our parishioners, Dr. Terrell, uh, for, of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so it's today I want to, um, since we are very close in proximity to the Feast of the Virgin Mary, we'll begin our prayer with um, the collect for her blessing. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who has taken to thyself the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of thy incarnate Son, grant that we who have been redeemed by his blood may share with her the glory of thine eternal kingdom. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The liturgy of the word begins on page 323 in your prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, good will towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given thy only Son to be unto us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life, give us grace that we may always most thankfully receive that his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavor ourselves to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, beginning at the first verse. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath, and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. 
Here endeth the reading. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedience to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Here endeth the lesson.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, chapter 15, beginning at the 21st verse. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus delivers mercy to those who ask. We ask for a lot in this world. Mom, can I have that toy airplane? Can we buy it? Dad, I think I want to play soccer. Can we register to play? Mom, I want to play violin. Can you pay for the violin and for the lessons? Grandma, that guitar looks really cool. I want it. Will you buy it for me? Our toys get more expensive as we get older. Dad, a new car, you know, so I can drive myself to school. That would be a great thing. Can we get it? But there are also things, those are materialistic things, but there are also things that are ethereal. Son, will you give me the obedience that I'm owed? Daughter, will you listen to me? Husband, will you give me the love that I need? Wife, will you give me the respect that I crave? We ask for so much in this world. Mother, father, son, daughter, friend, will you give me what I want? Will you give me this object, this thing, this feeling, whatever it is, whether tangible or ethereal, that thing that will bring peace, that thing that will bring joy to me, that thing that will bring me happiness. As parents, but even more so as human beings, there is something in us that yearns to make the people we love happy. When a child says, I want that object, or I want that situation, it will make me happy. And we want the happiness for them also, and we want to give it to them. We want happiness for our friends as well. That's why we buy them birthday presents, and we buy Valentine's gifts to those that we love. We get them the things they ask for, the things that will make them happy, because we want their happiness. And too often the word no is far from our lips. What continues to unfold are generations of people who are increasingly selfish, self-centered, materialistic, and lack the appreciation for the incredible resources at our disposal. We are a spoiled generation. This is true for us as individuals as well. We see what we want, shiny new cars, a new dress, jewelry, a new suit, new gadgets. I love gadgets. New cell phones, a new rifle. I know you, Washington County. I want them all, and because we have the money and there's no one to tell us no, we buy these things. And after the novelty of the newness wears off, these things collect dust, cars get scratched, rifles sit in the rifle case, and later these things are sold in garage sales or given to Goodwill. Many of us recognize the danger of giving children and adults everything they want. Constantly giving in actually hurts us. It doesn't prepare us for the real world, for closed doors or failure. Nor does it encourage us to aspire to earning something 
on our own. Saying no is not entirely the issue. Sometimes it's also important to know when to say yes. This is the lens that I want to look through as we read our gospel this morning. Being told no and being told yes. Jesus has just departed from Gennesaret uh, to the area of Tyre and Sidon. This is a geographic, a geographic shift for Jesus from the lakeside of Galilee to the shores of the Mediterranean. It's an area from Galilee that's populated by a mixture of his own people and Gentiles where he has been preaching the gospel both to his own Hebrew brothers and sisters as well as the Gentiles who are standing around listening. And he has just had another dispute with the religious leaders, some of whom have followed him all the way from Jerusalem. And they've asked this question of him, why do your followers break tradition and not wash their hands before they eat? This was a sign of uncleanness and it was a breach of their custom and their law. And Jesus responds with a question, why do you break the command to honor father and mother? So while they challenge him with the breaking of a custom, he challenges them with the breaking of the commandment to honor father and mother. In the commandment to honor the father and your father and your mother, the word honor in Hebrew literally means to make heavy, meaning to feed, to give something more weight. And what the command to honor father and mother implies is that in the same way that your parents cared for you when you were a helpless child, you then are to honor them, to make them heavy, to feed them and care for them in their old age. Jesus criticizes the Pharisees because they nullified this command by saying if you give money to the temple, the money that you would have used to take care of your parents, you don't need to honor your parents. And he says to them, you have broken the commandment in order to uphold your tradition, your custom. And Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. This response dumbifies the Pharisees. And Jesus turns to the crowds and answers the original question about not washing hands. He turns to the crowds and he says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles or makes one unclean, but what comes out of the mouth, that is what defiles or makes one unclean. If evil comes out of your mouth, it is worse because it's, it has come from your heart. This is the situation that Jesus is leaving Gennesaret, the region of Galilee, and going to the Gentile regions. He is geographically leaving his people but also symbolically walking away from them. So can you tell what in Matthew's gospel is what is being dealt with here in the first century? As Jewish believers in Jesus, they're dealing with the issue of can we integrate Gentiles into the life of the church, into our spiritual common life? Jesus gives us a sign of things to come, and he enters the region of Tyre and Sidon in the land of heathens. There he encounters this woman, a Canaanite. Canaanites were a people from the Old Testament that were always struggling with God's people. They were a hated group. And he's not really walking near this woman. She's shouting out, the text says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Other translations say that she is crying out, Lord, have mercy on me. It appears that Jesus is trying to avoid her, which is strange. He doesn't answer her. And she must have gone on and on, just like the cry of the Gentiles go on and on to know God. And the disciples who are close to Jesus are telling him to send her away so that she'll leave us alone. Just think... If the church was like that today, how empty would it be? If Christians acted the way the disciples did in this text, make them go away. They're sitting in my pew. They're wearing the wrong shoes with that dress. They have the wrong skin color, different political parties. Send them away. They're not like us. Once again, Jesus does something that we at first don't understand. 
he avoids her. He says, I didn't come for the Gentiles. Where's the compassion? Where's the empathy? This woman's daughter is tormented, and so is this woman. Where's the teddy bear Jesus that we've created in our minds who loves us just the way we are? The warm and fuzzy Jesus that we've heard of uh, people talk so much about. Where is that Jesus in this story? This biblical Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. This is important. The Canaanite woman is the only one in these stories, from the Pharisees to the disciples to the crowds that have been listening along. She is the only one to honor Jesus. She calls him from the beginning, Lord, Son of David. The implication is that he's a king. And when she kneels before him, she calls him Lord again when she says, Lord, help me. Her whole posture is submission. The Pharisees don't call him rabbi or teacher. The disciples don't call him Lord or master when they tell him to send her away. After her respectful address, do you think that he'll help now? After she says, Lord, help me, will he help now? He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That was the mentality of the Jewish people in Jesus' age. The Canaanites and Gentiles were dogs. They were thought of as lesser people, unclean people, heathens who worshipped false gods, idolaters. We see here is a Jesus who is much more human than we expect him to be. What does this woman do now? In her mind, she might be thinking, I've heard so much about this Jesus of love, this Jesus of compassion, this Jesus who fed the 5,000, the teddy bear Jesus, who cast out demons, made the blind see and the lame to run. I asked of him no more than he had already given to others, and he calls me a dog. What shall I say to him? How shall I respond? Shall I utter every expletive and curse his name and his God? Shall I thrash him? Shall I quietly walk away and lament my circumstances? Or shall I say, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She calls him Lord again. She acknowledges, yes, I am unworthy, just as all people who stand in the presence of God are unworthy. We're all unworthy. I am unworthy, but you are the one whose property it is to always have mercy. You'll remember that from our prayer of humble access. The one whose property it is always to have mercy. And Jesus says, woman, Great is your faith, let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. What appears to be Jesus' resistance to help this woman is Israel's resistance. God's people resisting to bring in outsiders. But based on her faith, he grants her prayer. For first century Christians, that answers the question of what to do with the Gentiles. In Matthew's gospel, this answers what to do with the Gentiles. Don't miss this. Whenever Jesus has a conversation with the Pharisees and the scribes, when they try to pin him down into a no-win situation, there's this back and forth conversation in which Jesus manages to turn the tables on them and get out of the no-win situation. But in this encounter, in this story, Jesus delivers the no-win situation. 
saying, I can't help you, I came to the Jews. He's fulfilling the Old Testament promises. But the woman says, yes, you did. But your nature is to have mercy, and you will help me. In her words and in their conversation and disagreement, we find the seed of what God is trying to communicate to us. That humbling ourselves before God in faith, trusting in His mercy and goodness, knowing that He is merciful, is what brings peace and restores brokenness. Her daughter was immediately freed. The things we buy, the clothes we wear, the houses we live in, the pride or power that we pump ourselves up with, our politics that we embrace, all of these are just things. They are the things that don't love us back. But Jesus, He loves us back. Through this woman, we see revealed God's desire for us to ask for those things which are meaningful, for healing, for deliverance, for peace and calamity. When all else was telling Jesus to say no or not now, when tradition and his understanding of the Father's will were telling him to say no, we discover the opportunity to show mercy and to say yes to an outsider. To heal eclipses our customs. The opportunity to bring relief and love to another human being supersedes exclusion. So, and whatever you're doing, whether you're shopping, whether you're in ministry, whether you're at work, whether you're in your own family, look to God for His will in that situation. Look to God to discover how to treat people, how to engage people that you encounter. And you will become vessels of mercy just as Jesus delivers mercy to those who ask. In the full assurance of the truth of God's word, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. 
Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth Thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer Thy holy sacraments. And to all Thy people, give Thy heavenly grace, and especially <clears throat> to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive Thy holy word, truly serving Thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech Thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold Thy gracious hand in all Thy works, that, rejoicing in Thy whole creation, they may honor Thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of Thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech Thee of Thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray also for those celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries, that God will continue to strengthen and bless them in their friendships and in their relationships. We pray also for those serving in our military services at home and abroad, that God may bring them home in peace. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Peter, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners.
Let us pray the words our Savior Christ hath taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.